our folks in. Good morning. You are back with the Vermont House Government Operations Committee. Um, we are meeting this morning with some uh, all of the folks who taken a look at uh, a governance proposal that we put on the table yesterday. Um, I think uh, to uh, just it's helpful to frame up why it is that uh, we are concerned about uh, the role that that governance um, plays um, in the situation that we're in uh, is really about looking at um, sort of all of the all of the assumptions and predictions that have been made over the last 10 years and recognizing that um, in the in the vast majority of cases um, we were wrong about those uh, assumptions and predictions that we made about the pension system. And that has contributed to um, to the legislature being handed uh, you know a bill for the ADEC payment that is um, both ballooning and unpredictable and uh, frankly, unsustainable. Um, and so we do want to make sure that we are looking at all of the potential solutions to this. Um, and, uh, and, you know, the speaker has been very clear that this is a priority for her and that she wants to put um, a fair amount of one-time money uh, into helping to fix the problem. And uh, from my perspective as chair of the Government Operations Committee, um, sort of on behalf of the legislature and uh, taxpayers of Vermont, I don't want to be in a position where we uh, squander the opportunity that this $150 million has for us to put our pensions on a path towards sustainability. Um, and so I don't want to uh, leave any stone unturned uh, in terms of trying to figure out if we can do better going forward on behalf of our public employees. Um, and so we're going to spend some time here this morning with, with the folks we have in the room with us, um, and we will come back to this right after judicial retention if, if we have time between then and noon. Uh, so I think what I'd like to do uh, is, is ask each of the folks who are with us today to talk for um, I don't know, try to talk for maybe 10 minutes or so, uh, leave some time for some questions so that hopefully we can get through each of the witnesses who's with us today. And uh, just for, for fun, I think I'm gonna start at the bottom of, of the list as it appears in front of me and ask Tom Galanka, who is currently the chair of BPIC to share any perspectives that you might have, Tom. Um, thank you for being with us this morning. Okay, thank, thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you here. Um, and I know I've voiced some initial concerns that I'll be happy to write down in terms of specific structures on governance, but I, I want to talk about sort of overall strategies and overall mission of VPIC and answer any questions in regards to, obviously, since I took over in January of 2016, um, I understand that there's been significant issues prior to 2016, and I'm the first one to acknowledge that if we were still in the 95th percentile of performance versus our peers, the first thing you should do is get rid of VPIC. Um, I want to argue today, though, or at least can try to convince you today, some of the progress that we have made over the past four years and the significant benefit of those changes and a, and a radical departure from the existing structure would, would, would cons considerably change that dynamic. I want to have the committee understand that. I first want to start off by saying I, I agree with all of the objectives listed in your proposal. Increasing the level of professional expertise is, is something that we're challenged with uh, every day in the committee. Um, I think mandating it and requiring the underlying boards to view it as a priority would be particularly helpful. Uh, in the past, um, they've consulted with me in regards to um, members that come to the board, but this is Vermont and it's difficult to get a lot of volunteers in, in this space. In addition, investment professionals in Vermont in particular may be prohibited from participating in boards of this nature due to compliance concerns. I know when I originally joined this board, there was a significant issue of getting prior approval from our broker dealer to even be able to participate. So I think making hoops or mandating that is gonna be rather um, challenging. I think it's a good goal, and I think working with the committees to, to add that as a significant objective is, is quite significant. Uh, maintain the representation and participation, I think, is key. Um, looking over this proposal, and, and my roots come from the VMERS side. I was the VMERS rep appointed 
through um, Governor Douglas. Um, I, I was a city council member for 12 years and I know the importance of uh, Vemer's representation on this board. Um, they have about a billion dollars of this trust invested in it. And I think it's a significant concern if radical changes happen amongst the Vemer's plan. And, and as a member, former member of Vemer's, I would be extremely concerned on that without having a thorough review of what the impacts would be. Streamlined decision-making process, I think is always a best practice. And I would strongly encourage that. Uh, require more frequent experience studies and enhance transparency around investment fees. I totally agree with that. And that's part of the process that we have tried to undertake since 2016. I wanna to get to the numbers and I wanna talk about those numbers and really understand the dynamics that were happening last June. We were two months into a pandemic. So there's three things that I think conflate this issue and bring it to a head right now. Um, just as you shouldn't use today's numbers where we're showing up fiscal year 15%, I think you really have to look at last June for the three things that are really combining to making the negative numbers look relatively poor. And I think a longer term perspective, I think is more appropriate. One, COVID, um, we, you know, the markets were down 30% in, in February. VPIC was only down 10% and part of the, at the worst of it, that was at the end of March. We recovered all of that by June. So you're showing a flat rate of return but think of your old 401ks and your old portfolios. That's a testament to what VPIC did last year. If we can avoid the losses, we can have significant benefits on the upside. And the second thing is smoothing. Uh, smoothing is a lagging indicator and it's an indicator of years gone by. And so you're still having impacts prior to my tenure to that, that I think VPIC is being judged on. I would suggest in the future that smoothing really be looked at as one context, but it just hides the reality of what you, where you really are in terms of fiscal position. Um, making decisions on the fly using a smoothing methodology, I think limits, limits your approach. The third decision is our fiduciary decision. Or the third thing that I think need to be considered is our fiduciary decision to reduce the rate of return, which I believe has nothing to do with politics and it has nothing to do with past performance. It has everything to do with future potential. All those three kind of combined to make the actuarial numbers from last fiscal year look uh, weaker than if you were to look at it today. And if you look at your documents that I submitted today, you will actually see the investment performance numbers from December of this year, which actually gives you a really good track record for my, my tenure. I started in January 2016. And uh, since that time, if you pull up the investment performance in, in looking at it today, and I'll do that right now, the five-year number that we've annualized since beginning this process as of the end of the year was closer to 9.8%. Uh, and if you look in that performance report, that's in the top 19 percentile of a peer, peer review of one to $10 billion. If you further that out, uh, our seven year number is now over the 7%, it's at 7.17%. It's in the 34th percentile of peer review. And if you look at the 10 year, it's still in the 69th percentile, but showing at about 7.24%. I don't wanna belabor the issue in regards to performance, but I think it, it bears repeating that investment performance is important, but you have to look at it, what's happening today and what we've done since 2016. You know, since 2016, we have had a laser focused strategy in regard to lowering costs. If you look at the other, um, uh, document that I included on there. It's the way VPIC looks at fees and looks at how we manage our managers and whether or not there's uh, incremental benefit to having an active manager versus a passive approach. Um, I heard questions on, on indexing. We've done all of that. We've, we've indexed $3 billion or so of the trust into different indexes. So every time a manager comes in, we're looking to see where that brings incremental value. Um, and I think it's showing uh, results and, and I'm proud of those results for the past five years. I am concerned if you throw out VPIC, what does that transition look like? And the governance proposal that I see is that you're starting from scratch. We've 
built relationships with all of our managers. We have contracts in place. We have uh, board seats on ESG initiatives. We've, we've managed through a divestment issue that came about through legislative changes. There's a lot of different moving parts in, in VPIC that I think need to be addressed. Um, this past Tuesday, VPIC had a meeting and, and as an extension of our fiduciary meeting, which we had in December, where we brought in an, an expert from Aon to give us a morning, a three and a half hour uh, fiduciary talk to our committee members. One of the recommendations was to do a governance study. We didn't do it at that time because of the cost and we figured we'd be a little bit more fiscally prudent and stage these out so we weren't bombarding our members. But at this past Tuesday meeting, we recommended that we perform that study and have something that could be available in a relatively short amount of time, you know, possibly over the summer as early as that. In addition, I spoke yesterday with our um, chief investment consultant at RVK, which is uh, Jim Voitko, who, who's a world renowned expert in uh, structure and plan design as well as governance. And he has offered his um, availability uh, to testify in front of this committee to answer uh, best practice approach to governance. And I would hate to see this committee make recommendations without at least hearing from RVK, hearing from a governance study that VPIC is willing to, un to perform and to understand what the unintended consequences of moving away from the current structure would entail. So with that, I, I don't wanna go over all the, the um, materials I included with you, but they include the fees, they include how we review those fees, they include the current investment performance. And if we're gonna throw VPIC out, I really wanna have a thorough review of what we have done since 2016. And it's been drastic. And I think it's, it's significantly improved where we are today, where we'll be in the future. And if you look at it, and I'd also say, quite frankly, the three investment staff that work for the treasurer's office are probably the three most valuable staff members you have in state government. And, um, they're tirelessly working both for, for, um, for Beth in regards to investments, but they also do a lot of other things in regards to the 457 plan, as well as ESG initiatives. And uh, I know they, they've, they've come a long way in regards to professionalism, and I'd like to see that continue. Um, I'm always willing and, and uh, open to change, but I, uh, I'm quite excited about where we are today. So it's, it's frustrating to see us being judged on a lagged stream or lagged uh, actuarial number that has no basis in reality going forward. So with that, I thank you for your time and I'll answer any questions. Questions from committee members. John Gannon. Tom, thank you for testifying this morning and, and hey, thank you for your, your leadership on BPIC. And, and you know, I, I have looked at the investment performance numbers and they, they are dramatically improved. Um, there's no question about that. However, we had a long period of time where that was not the case. Um, and, and my concern is, you know, your leadership, I think, has, been the, has resulted in these changes. Um, but there's been no structural change to ensure that if you were to get run over by a bus tomorrow, um, that this good performance would continue. And so uh, I'm just, if you could just address that, I mean, and why we had such a long history of poor performance and missing our investment assumptions. You know, it's a great question. Um, it's difficult to get volunteers for a position of this magnitude. And it's a very complicated um, issue. I happen to have a, a collection of strengths that make me ideal, I think, for this position. I, I come from a background as a city council member. I was a city council member for 12 years here in Montpelier. I know the ins and outs of how, what people are looking for, how a board should work. Uh, when I first came to the board, part of the problem was really strategy and direction and how you focus the board meeting. They would meet from eight to five and, and strategy discussions were, we're not really laser focused. And, and that, is an, that is a key function of a chair, which is really to look at what are the key issues that we have to address. And it's interesting, I looked over, and I told you this the other day, I, I looked over an email I sent our former director of investments, you know, a couple months after um, I started, and it was basically the seven items that we're talking about today, which included benchmarking, indexing, 
um, looking at a better way of looking at this portfolio, really critically analyzing the need for internal staff versus external management, and looking at all of the fees that we have paid. And so state government and state pension funds are not like your own personal portfolio. It takes time to work through the process. And so it's I don't want to use the Titanic analogy because that has a bad ending, but, but I think it, it is like moving a, a big ship. And so there's incremental changes you have to make each year to really see positive results and to become in the top quartile in peer performance. It doesn't, it doesn't happen overnight. I get it that uh, you know, we need investment staff to help manage us. One of the priorities I had when we first started was to professionalize the staff. So if I do get hit by a bus, these, these policies and, and protocols will be ingrained in how they do business in, in the state pension fund. And so bringing in a quality CIO was my priority. That took two years because we had to get approval for, for payroll change. We had to get go through the whole state process. We had a, a, a robust RFP to, uh, to change our investment consultant because we felt we weren't getting the investment advice that we needed, uh, quite frankly. And so these changes are incremental. I'm hopefully implementing changes that will, will go on behind beyond me. I worry if you change it right now, you're gonna lose a lot of that momentum. And I just respectfully ask the ability to have the, um, the study follow through, possibly into the summer, maybe early fall, so you would be able to make informed decisions. I'm not averse to change. I think change is good. Um, new structure is good, a new board is good. Um, I just would worry about the implication of saying we're getting rid of VPIC and how that would impact uh, our progress. So hopefully that answers your question. No, I, I understand that concern. Um, one other question is, is, do you think VPIC should be more independent of the treasurer's office? Um, I do, and it has no disrespect for Beth because I think Beth has, a tremendous, has been a tremendous advocate for defined benefit plans. I think as the pension system uh, you know, grows and becomes much you know, bigger, obviously, as you add more money into it, it becomes bigger, it gets from 5 billion to 10 billion, there needs to be some level of independence. So decisions aren't made politically, decisions are made thoughtfully amongst a good uh, group of fiduciaries. That being said, the treasurer's office performs a, a key role right now, that independence probably is going to take more than, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's going to take a while, particularly among the state process. You know, the treasurer's office provides a tremendous amount of key support, both from plan administration as well as uh, contracting. You know, we use the attorney general's office, you know, for, for advice. Um, it will not happen overnight. And so I, I look at Beth, I worry about the political implications of the governance model structure where the treasurer is, is placed in charge as new chair. The reality is it may not be Beth at some point, you know, Beth, no, no offense. I, I think we have to plan for a world without Beth. And how does that world look, including a world without me? And I think that is a goal. And I know the prior uh, investment director of VPIC wanted that to be a, a priority of mine early on. And I, I didn't think we were ready. We're getting close, um, but it's going to entail more staff. It's going to entail, you know, does this new entity function as the plan benefit provider? Does it create as a website like other states have? There's a lot of issues of structure that I don't think have been worked out. There also always needs to be a memorandum of understanding with the treasurer's office because of the work we do in concert. Thank you. Peter Anthony. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Mr. Galanka. I, I uh, return to uh, a theme that John most recently touched on and Namely, um, what's a good size board uh, if it's a reconfigured VPEC? And uh, I guess the subsidiary question that John most recently focused in on, how can we uh, be structured for success as opposed to be so, pardon the phrase, idiosyncratically dependent on a, a couple of very talented people? It's, that's, that's a real challenge in Vermont. Uh, I mean, I love my state, but we're not overrun with people uh, who are in a position to volunteer for nothing virtually yeah. and are also the best and the brightest. Uh, so those are the two areas which, which I'm grappling with. Thank you. Well, getting to your question, your first question, um, I think it's always a struggle. Um, 
actually <laughs> refresh the topic. I'm going to your second question. The first question again, could you repeat that? My computer was going in and out. What's Sorry. a good size board? Oh, size board. Um, I've been on many boards and I've found a, a good size board is seven to 12. You know, I, I, don't, I think once you get past that, it's very difficult to, to function. I read the Boston College report that Representative Gannon reported. I think they listed six to 10. I think a board of this nature is probably gonna be around 10, you know, it would, 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 would work very well. 17 gets a little unwieldy and, and I'd be concerned over that. And the second part of your question in regards to how do you get volunteers, um, you get volunteers by making the, making the committee meetings meaningful. And what I mean by that is we've had a, a bunch of volunteers that felt that they weren't utilized correctly or that we were wasting their time. And so I worry again in, in regards to the structure, some of the subsidiary boards, particularly if the big board has ultimate authority, may feel obsolete and it will be much, much more difficult to get volunteers. So I think your second question is great because it is difficult to get volunteers to work here in the state of Vermont. But I think if they see a common vision or of an interest level, I think it's fascinating, you know, particularly um, you know, working with institutional uh, uh, money. Um, but it, it, it would be a challenge in Vermont, particularly I think with compliance constraints and um, uh, the number of people and travel, you know, we're working through COVID world is through Zoom, but in the past it was a day trip to Montpelier and, and it was a day or two day, two day venture. I, I hope we were able to expand on uh, interactive meetings like this where people can participate and also work at the same time. Madam Chair, if I may be permitted to follow up uh, since it's come up, uh, my experience with board members and their eagerness to stick with it uh, also revolves around a meaningful meeting but part of the uh, content of a meaningful meeting is that at the end of that meeting, uh, the conclusions, decisions, and here's the linkage part, can be translated into action that the board members feel good about, that they actually made a difference and something uh, happens day after tomorrow that was not true yesterday. Could you comment on that? I'd argue that current VPIC members would say the latter, that they do feel valued and they feel like they have made a contribution into, into making a more sustainable system for the state of Vermont. Um, you know, we're at about 5.3 billion now. Your study shows us at 4.5. That's, you know, $800 million that we, you know, it's, it, it, it's a significant amount that warrants discussion, not necessarily that it's gonna continue, but, but I, think, I think members feel uh, wanted and members feel um, utilized for their expertise and capacities. Um, I, I had a long conversation yesterday with Kim Gleason and, and her, her representation on VMERS and, and her passion for VMERS. And it's, it's, it's interesting to see there are, there are fewer and fewer people in Vermont that are willing to step up. And, and so that is a challenge and, and making meetings more meaningful, I think is paramount. I worry you'll make the other subsidiary boards meetings less meaningful. <clears throat> So committee, we have, uh, we're at a decision point here because um, we have two places where we could be and could well use our time this morning. Um, uh, we also have the advantage of being in a remote meeting environment where we can, um, we can also get the information that we need to from the other meeting that's happening right now. So what I'm wondering committee is, would you like to continue with this and, um, and review the judicial retention presentations knowing that you have until April 5th, I believe, to return your judicial retention ballots? Or would you like to um, push a pause here in committee right now, go to judicial retention and hope that we can come back to this conversation before lunchtime. So uh, committee, if you, <clears throat> if anyone has thoughts on that, please uh, unmute and weigh in. I'd like to stick with it, Madam Chair. You know, I, I choose number one. All right, we are feeling good about listening into the judicial retention reports um, on our own time. All right, great, thank you.
I just want to clarify they're due April 1st, not April, April 1st, 5th. not April 5th. Okay. Thank you. April Fool's Day. There we go. Um, okay, so we'll continue with what we're doing here. And um, I think next I'd like to invite Beth Pierce to share her thoughts on the proposed governance changes that we put on the table yesterday. So Beth, thanks for being with us this morning. Well, thank you very much. I did send over a uh, package um, uh, and don't be alarmed by the size. I was responding to some other informational needs that the, the committee had expressed, um, but the first 10 or so pages are what, what we're really looking at. Um, but before we start this, I, I think that we need to put some things in perspective. And frankly, I'm troubled uh, when I listen to the conversation we've been having over this, um, over the last um, um, several months, frankly, since um, since I produced my first report on this. Um, and it's it's been a lot of, well, sort of like what we used to see in DC, a very dysfunctional process. Uh, you know, everybody is upset and they're looking for somebody to blame. So, you know, Wall Street's to blame. Well, no, it's not Wall Street, it's the actuary. No, it's not the actuary because the actuary made the best they could, but you know, uh, the decisions that were made um, by the General Assembly or the governor in terms of workforce or people or um, not funding something, they're to blame. Uh, no, it's not that, it's the investment board. Nope, they made a change, so then we, you know, we, we have to move on and say it's something else. That's not what we're supposed to be doing. What we're supposed to be doing is solving the problem together. And for me, it's time to step up and say, we all have a share in this. We all have work to do. Now, I can point to things that were done by different parts of this group, whether it's the General Assembly, whether it's the governor, whether it's our office, whether it's investments, whether it's the actuary, we're all in this together. And let's try to find the solution and work together is uh, something I wanted to say up front, because it, as I listen to this testimony, it's not about giving you a, uh, a bill. And nothing's uh, in, 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 in absence of anything else. There's been communication. We need to work together. We need to refine that communication. But it's 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 just not the, the case. And we now have to all recognize we're all part of this. And we have to work together. So on that note, I'm going to start with my presentation and thank you for uh, giving me the the, the latitude to um, to have that uh, that piece. And hopefully, I can get to my presentation. There we are. So um, I had five, um, and these are, it says preliminary review, preliminary review because we haven't had um, a, um, a long time to look, take a look at this. But uh, I have uh, five points. Uh, the first is that uh, replacing the, uh, the the replacement of VPIC with the adoption of the Vermont Retirement Commission. I would not recommend it for a number of reasons. Uh, one, uh, the VPIC structure is showing results, as uh, Tom has said. Um, we've uh, also begun a process to look at a, a study by an independent consultant. We did that back in 2005. It was created, the legislature asked us to do a study. We changed the composition of the board from a, a, a group of 17 to the six plus one that we have now. Uh, we, we went through some other processes there. Uh, to me, if we're going to do this, that's not just jump to do something. Let's make sure we're doing the right thing. We're working together in a thoughtful, thorough way, and that we do need to have that type of study before we, we, we jump ahead with the conclusions. Uh, I would, as, as I heard other folks as well, say that we need to um, uh, change the uh, actuary statute, uh, the, the statute so that we complete experience studies every three years rather than the current five years. I think if you look at the data I had later, earlier, uh, later in the report, you see that uh, we, we've done a little bit of that, but I think putting that in statute is absolutely um, a good way to go. And I think that we're all in um, on the same page on that. Um, I was confused by the report where it said um, uh, uh, that uh, um, uh, return assumption and actuarial assumptions would be done by the commission. Um, I hope that doesn't mean all assumptions because the actuarial assumption in terms of rate of return, uh, perhaps um, uh, taking a look at the real rate of return, including inflation, might be something I think that the VPIC uh, or um, uh, would, would be the most uh, authoritative group to, to make that uh, go through that process. The reality is the demographic speech system varies, uh, the turnover as we've seen as, as policy changes have been made and the teacher side with the, the impact of that is on retirements and the impact on turnover. I think that uh, those uh, other assumptions need to stay uh, with the, the uh, respective boards. I'm not sure if I read that correctly. Um, so I did want to clarify that. I do believe that there should be, it should be under the authority of the VPIC, the setting of the uh, assumed rate of return. return. That said, I think that 
you're correct in pointing out that there should be input from the other groups. Uh, but in the end, one, you know, having a, a situation where you could have a veto if one group disagrees is, is not a good set of uh, organizational set. And again, keeping the remaining uh, actual assumptions with the uh, trustee boards where they belong. Um, there are existing, uh, there was some discussion about uh, training and uh, what, what is done there and, and, and the past testimony and some of the things that I've heard over the last uh, week. And, uh, you know, what do they, uh, how are they trained and, uh, and, and what, what, what that, uh, the, the uh, st enabling statute is fairly skimpy on that and that we should do more to, um, um, to um, uh, codify that. I've attached in my presentation a very well developed, a very well developed um, educational policy that VPIC has, and it's uh, several pages. I invite you. It's Appendix A, I believe, in my uh, my package. Um, it's very well defined. It talks to the to the issues as a as a fiduciary. We are doing that. I think it's great that uh, it's being done, and I think the leadership of again Tom uh, as we're moving forward, uh, it's there. But I think codifying that or putting some of that policy or just defining that you should have such a policy into the statute would be something that we can do. But I, I would invite you to take a look at that. It is very meaningful, uh, and they hold the members' uh, feet to the fire in terms of getting uh, uh, maintaining their. Uh, and improving their, their knowledge of investments. You know, we talked a little earlier about whether um, a former teacher board member was a, um, um, was a, um, a special um, a, a expert or not. And I like the term that, um, that uh, Jeff said, a learned person. We have a lot of learned folks in this state that can, with the right background and the right opportunities for training, be um, uh, very useful members in this committee. I, I venture to guess if I ask um, most of you in this committee, may, um, represent again, and I, I won't do the quiz, but you know, if you ask you what was a risk parity um, um, investment, um, most of you would probably say you don't know. Uh, but I can assure you that Joe Mackey, who's a former teacher and retiree, knows that and he knows the components of it. And he knows the same thing that I do, which is we don't want that in our fund. Um, and I think Tom would agree with that as well. They've learned that over the years. They're learned people. They've, they've learned and they need to be respected for their contributions to the board. Uh, we also um, uh, have a, um, a recommendation with respect to the um, uh, financial information. I've attached in a, uh, uh, in Appendix B um, a lot of information that's out there. Um, we have information in our annual report, which we send to the General Assembly, which meets basically everything that you've been asking for. It's there in, in, in written form, sent to you annually on the 15th of January. We have performance data. We have actuarial data. We have um, uh, underfunding reports. We have um, a, a site on transparency, by the way, which was given an award because we we're the first one in the country to do that level of transparency. Um, so that's all out there. And I invite you to take a look at it. Um, at that same time, I think codifying that in statute is a very good idea, uh, and uh, and uh, we should um, uh, take uh, take that step. Uh, there's also a, a group of reports just to covers to, to remind you that we have made these presentations on what the upward pressures are in terms of um, uh, retirement um, upward pressures, whether it's um, uh, turnover, whether it's uh, salaries, whether it's position levels, whether it's incentive programs, whether it's underfunding, whether it's the continued underfunding of healthcare, whatever it might be, and have those you know, submitted those to the various committees, uh, including um, um, uh, government operations. So there's a little bit of a, of a, of a PowerPoint with just a pit, the front pages of those. And if you'd like to see any of those reports, they're available in my office. Um, so that's pretty much it. I would like to get back to a couple of points on, again, um, item number uh, one on the list, which is the, um, the investment, uh, the, the VRC, I guess, the, um, uh, the commission. Um, I think there's some issues with it. That's again, take the time to do it right. Commission size, I would agree that smaller is better. Uh, commission composition, uh, we've talked a little bit about that and uh, I have copied the um, uh, GFOA Government Finance Officers Association recommendations around that and a diverse group including employee membership or, or, or member um, members of the system as part of it. I think that this, when I read the, and look at the numbers in this, um, in this proposal, it diminishes the impact uh, those folks have. I think chair appointment is um, very important. 
the particular proposal says uh, would make me the chair, and I think that's a mistake. Uh, not because I um, don't think I can do the job, but I think that number one, it should not be an elected person who's the chair of the committee. Uh, and you don't know who the next treasurer is going to be many years down the road, I hope, um, but uh, you, you, you don't uh, want to put VPIC um, or whatever um, um, uh, uh, subsequent um, um, entity, although I think VPIC is the model you should continue um, um, in, in the hands of any elected official. It should be an appointed, a chair, an independent chair that's appointed um, and uh, has the, uh, the skill set such as Tom and is at the pleasure of the board, the six member board. Uh, uh, we we reevaluate we re um, the job description. We evaluate his performance every year and, uh, and provide feedback to Tom and uh, he's done a great job. I think that again, uh, it's, it would be better to have uh, that model than to, um, to put the treasurer in, in that position. Uh, I'm on 29 or 30 boards and committees, by the way. So uh, uh, but, um, I recognize that uh, there's um, 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 a lot of other areas that we would need to concentrate on as well. And I think that an independent chair could give it the attention that it needs and deserves. And I think it helps with decision-making, uh, frankly. Uh, and getting to the question about should, should it be part of the treasurer's office, I am a proponent, as is Tom, um, and is that we should be spinning this off into its own entity uh, and standing away from, uh, uh, away from um, uh, the, the politics that you might see um, in, in, in the current structure, um, outside politics. Inside VPIC, I would agree with Bob uh, Hooper, I would agree, sorry, Representative Hooper, uh, Tom, that there is no politics in that meeting, but the, the political structure that it is in and what we're seeing right now, I would like to see a separate entity spun off and, and have the authority to do, um, uh, do the, the kind of good work that uh, needs to be done. I'm thinking of a model, instead of the New Hampshire model, which you put out there, and by the way, the New Hampshire model is for a joint trustee board and investment um, um, committee. So I don't think it, it necessarily follows to the, the configuration that we have in this state. I'm thinking more of the model in PRIM, Massachusetts uh, Pension Reserve Investment Management Reserve uh, System, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, what they call SWIB, the, uh, the um, uh, State of Wisconsin Investment Board. Uh, Florida, I believe, has one too. That's a, it's a much more distinct, separate, unit uh, that has the independence is in, and can hire the types of consultants it needs, has a, has, a, has a strong chair and a great CIO to go with it. We have those right now. We've got a strong chair. We've got a great CIO. My office provides the support it needs. Uh, we will continue to be able to provide that. But I think moving toward that independent model is the way to go. Um, I'll wait to see what the, uh, the consultant says as well. I think we need to hire a consultant with that skill set uh, to do this. This is too important to just run and do this quickly uh, because we think that um, uh, there's a need to uh, to settle some some issue that um, again we, we're going back and forth who's to blame this is not that time this is let's do a thoughtful approach about how we can make it better and how we can move forward and I would wait until we were able to to get a professional consultant in to take a look at this as Tom said over the summer or in the fall and bring that um, bring any solutions and recommendations back to you um, in um, uh, in time for the next legislative session. Thank you Beth. <clears throat> um, Bob Hooper has his hand up. Uh, thank you Madam Chair. Madam Treasurer, it is one of my uh, greatest pleasures in life, no matter how many times we butt heads, to be on a first name basis with you and I object, <laughs> okay. I object to you trying to change that at this point. Um, I wish you would expound a little bit and, and I appreciate the, the level of expertise that you bring to this discussion and your recommendations. Um, much has been made about the actuary being wrong and giving us assumptions that were wrong. And my impression of that is sort of the other side, and I, I wish you would correct me if I am wrong, that the actuary gave us estimates on what basically national experience should be, and that our workforce was deviant to that experience, and that's the spread. It's not a question of being wrong. It's a question of us being different. And if that is the case, 
how in the future do we compensate for that difference? Well, you know, an estuary will take um, national trends. So you're correct, um, um, uh, Representative Hooper. Well, you're in this committee. I'm going to call you that. You know. So hey, but in my in my phone uh, my phone list, you're called Hoop. We'll leave it at that too. But um, um, the um, the actuary does look at national trends, for instance, on, on rate of return. We're not looking at how did we perform because it's not the, uh, you know, the, um, the um, uh, tail wag wagging the dog or vice versa. I never get those things quite right. But um, it, they're looking at national trends. What's the, what's the market looking like? What are the capital markets likely to do over the next 30 years? And they're coming up with, with assumptions based on that. They take our asset allocation. Um, and they put it into the model, but you do not want to be in a position where the the um, uh, the required rate of return is a thing pushing the um, uh, pushing the envelope on what you do for investments. They sh you should have an investment um, uh, uh, investment strategy that uh, takes the maximizes return with the appropriate level of risk. But uh, so they do look at national trends. They look at mortality. Now I remember I I think it was. Um, uh, 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 Representative Anthony, you were talking about, you know, the uh, teacher versus a, um, a forklift operator. I'm not sure if I remember the quite um, the occupation, but they do take a look at the types of occupations. They take a look at the um, uh, the um, uh, different mortality scales for those, and they try to blend that to what our population looks like. So the mortality in a uh, table for a teacher system is going to be very different than the mortality uh, table for a municipal system or a state system. Uh, they're going to take a look at uh, those issues and they're going to make some assumptions based on the best data that they have. They take a look at inflation rates from a variety of different uh, so uh, sources. Uh, but things do happen, as, um, as someone said earlier, uh, uh, you know, someone in D.C. makes a statement and all of a sudden the markets are, you know, um, in, a, in a bit of a royal. Uh, there are other pieces that are in our control and where we have varied. For instance, again, getting back to, um, I'm taking a look at the presentation I sent you last Friday, and I'm taking a look at the teachers. And one of the um, pieces in there for the uh, why we were off from our gains and losses was a contribution shortfall for the healthcare um, appropriation. Uh, as treasurer in 2012, I brought uh, to your attention that um, we, uh, we were not fully funding the healthcare as a subfund of the pension system. Uh, we did fix that, but it didn't happen to 2015. Uh, so that was responsible for from 2011 to 2020, and remembering that it's only 11 to 15, 101 million dollars of the um, of the um, the losses, the turnover, net turnover um, for the uh, for the employees um, in in the teacher system. Uh, so hiring and, and, and terminations and turnover of staff, about 320 million dollars of the um, of the. Um, of the changes. That has a lot to do with education policy. It has a lot to do with property tax policy. It has a lot to do with um, uh, 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 additional functions that a teacher might have. And someone brought up the issue of Bennington today. I think that was Jeff and uh, some of the, some of the, um, uh, uh, the external events that may have a, uh, an impact on people's decisions to stay. Uh, COVID certainly has an impact on that. Similarly, retirements, people's decisions to retire. An actuary is going to do based on trends that we've seen, but as things change, as there are more pressures, on, 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 you know, there will be variances to that. Um, so again, I would say that the actuary is doing uh, their best um, to, to, to come up with assumptions that, um, that are predictive and are the best, but you're going to have variances against them. And a lot have to do with external events, national trends, and the others have to do with the decisions we make as a state around the issues of turnover, around the issues of contributions, around the issues of, um, of uh, salaries and positions. And we have some control over those. Peter Anthony. Uh, thank you very much, Beth. You, you, um, you stopped just where I wanted you to, if that, even though I didn't have any influence over it. Uh, I think uh, Rep. Hooper is getting at a subject which did come up. I, I beg the chair's indulgence because I am crossing over from governance. But the point is, if there's a, uh, a strict uh, sort of firewall between uh, the governance structure managing the asset pool as opposed to other entities that are uh, managing the, the sort of benefit configuration, where you ended up is a point at which the actuaries could not possibly anticipate. And it's the 
a bugaboo, if you permit the phrase, of an aspect of local control, whereas the state does not control, it turns out, uh, a lot of the decision making revolving around retirement. I'm not sure they should, but mm -hmm. the point is it makes it a very uh, uh, unsuccessful attempt uh, because you don't know what the incentives are in a decentralized decision-making <laughs> environment, which we have in one aspect of this business. And that's uh, uh, maybe it's a minority of the overall dynamic, but it has proven to be quite important uh, statistically and uh, and financially. So yeah, how, how do we integrate that? Because it's not true that the state has control of that. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I think there, they have some control and other parts they do not. I would agree with you. Um, and again, I remember testifying in front of this committee and in front of appropriations. And, and I remember occasion Senate finance uh, as well. And my analogy was when you take the balloon and you press it at one end in terms of local decisions around property tax, local decisions around uh, schools and, and, uh, and whether you're going to say we want uh, to give an incentive to have some teachers retire so that uh, uh, f comes in with uh, other folks come in with lower salaries. Although I understand that a lot of that is already kind of um, worked its way through in my conversations with Jeff. But when you press the balloon at this end, the balloon comes out at the other end. You know what I mean? And uh, hopefully the balloon doesn't pop. Um, but uh, there are issues of um, uh, that uh, that are in our control and others that are not in our control. Um, we can look at trends. But as we change policy, it's it's it, an actuary does not have a crystal ball that's going to say, um, you know, that we're going to make this change in terms of um, of our um, uh, school contracts, for instance, or something along that line, and be able to predict uh, the impact of that. Um, so they do the best with the trends that they have, the in information they have, and I think they do a good job. Um, but we have different factors that are involved, national decisions. And you know, I, I remember when, and I said this in earlier testimony, when uh, a certain senator said um, um, that uh, it was okay if states and, uh, and, um, and localities went bankrupt, he wasn't worried about that. And the next day the bond market went sky high and everything went, went, went crazy. Um, you know, uh, something happened in November of 16 that had an impact on the interest rates. Uh, again, trying to stay away from the politics. These are national trends. No one's going to predict who the president is and what the, um, the market is going to, um, to look like. They're going to look at capital market markets and, 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 uh, and see. But, you know, there's variability and volatility in these things. At the same time, there's, there's issues at the local level. Um, as we, as you just pointed out, that was very, very helpful, uh, Representative. And there are things that within the legislature that we can do within the, with the within the investment committee that we can do. As I said earlier, this should not be a who's to blame. This should be about how are we going to work together to find solutions. No one is handing you a bill without an understanding of of where the, the pieces are coming from. And we all have to work together to find the solutions. Now that gets back to governance. That some of that I just talked about is benefits and, and liabilities, but it really gets back to governance. You need to have the proper professionals in the right places to do this and to do it well. And I believe that the current VPIC structure is close to that. As uh, Tom said, we're evolving. I think that as we move forward, and we create an entity that stands on its own, similar to the Massachusetts model, similar to the Wisconsin model, not the New Hampshire model, but those models, I think you're gonna have better, um, better economies of scale, um, um, increased performance, and, um, and a much more nimble um, 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 entity moving forward. Bob Hooper. Thank you, Madam Chair. I may be going into minutia here and I would appreciate uh, you're stopping me if you think so too. Uh, Beth, a lot has been made about the legislature's underfunding in the past as being our contribute to, a contribution to this problem. Um, in terms of the actuary's analysis of where our plans are, uh, we've heard some reference to the teachers basically taking a, a higher paying job a couple of years before retirement, which mm -hmm. effectively is kind of like spiking and could be managed. But on a, on a global scale, does the actuary have the ability to look into situations like our state police where we're down 30 positions, so other officers are working a lot of extra overtime, or our correctional facilities where we have the same problem 
where extra and massive amounts of overtime are being injected into the system in unanticipated ways and therefore changing what we're expecting to see in terms of workforce? Yeah. So I would say yes and no. They do look at our trends. Uh, so when we did a risk assessment and we did a very comprehensive risk assessment a while back, uh, Representative Gannon, you were part of that process. And if you recall, we took a look at trends of it, inflows and outflows. Uh, so when you do a valuation, you're saying this is a closed period. It's as of June 30th, 2020, 2019 and so on. In an open process, what you're looking and saying, what are the trends? What's the turnover coming in and leaving? So we have some historical data on that. But as you just pointed out, workforce changes and workforce issues, uh, vacancies um, have an impact on people's lives uh, and uh, workforce decisions, workforce policies impact people's decisions about retirement. And uh, an actuary, again, uh, can look at trends. They can make some assumptions based on, uh, on uh, uh, probabilities of retirements at different salaries and ages, and that's, that's in their tables. But if you have a, um, uh, a uh, specific workforce uh, change or, or process um, um, uh, that uh, it's, it's implemented after, after the valuation, you're going to have variation. Your, your workforce clearly is an issue on a policy decisions made uh, that has an impact on the results. I don't know if I went around the, the round on that one, um, Representative Hooper. Um, well, that... my, my point kind of was that our, our or the administration's position on not making sure that government is running the way it should be and is expected to be, which would include making sure positions are filled and that our, mm -hmm. our trends are consistent, uh, plays a role in this. So we're not all immune from uh, the critique, I guess. Yeah, Thank you. absolutely. Absolutely. Now, on the other hand, going the other direction, um, and I, I used this example earlier, in 2010 and in 2016, so two different um, um, governors um, made um, um, proposals for retirement incentives. So incentivizing people to um, give them a cash incentive to go out the door and, um, um, and uh, presumably that would reduce operating costs, recognizing it would have an increased cost on the pensions. Uh, we pointed out the, um, the, the need to remember that, again, pressing the balloon on one side, you have the, the, um, the, the uh, impact on the other. Um, and person personnel decisions had an impact on that. The first one we did, I believe, and this is off the top of my head, so it could be, it's the best mem of my memory at the moment. Our initial assumption was that the retirement incentive would increase the unfunded liability by roughly $79 million. And it also assumed on the other end, uh, on the operating costs that you'd have a break even point if you kept one third of the positions vacant after that, that occurred. Um, instead of that happening, from 2010 to 2014, we added 543 positions. Now, those are decisions that are made in appropriations. Those are decisions that are made in, in, in terms of workforce and in needs. And I'm not going to second guess any of those decisions because I'm not a workforce expert. I don't know what the needs are in corrections versus uh, social services. Um, you folks have a better feel for that than I do. Uh, but those decisions impacted because now, instead of having those positions um, open, you've now put in additional people into those positions, which creates additional liabilities for the pension system above and beyond the original projection. In 16, we said, we're going to do a better job. Okay, we're going to do this again. We're going to do a better job. Um, it's, it was a smaller, and uh, I think we had a net 10 reduction in, in the last time I took a look at it. We failed to meet the, um, the objectives again in terms of vacancies. Um, those have an impact on, um, uh, on, uh, on the, the valuation results and on the, on the assumptions. It's a group process. They're all interrelated and we have to, again, work and find the solutions and find the underlying issues instead of saying, well, they, they did it wrong or Wall Street did it wrong. You know, it's, again, going back, it's, it's uh, the hedge funds guys did it to us. Well, we don't have any hedge funds, so that can't be it. Um, but um, again, it's, 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 it's a group effort to solve the problem and a group effort to analyze it. And the same type of analysis needs to happen with respect to um, uh, creating the, um, a uh, retirement commission. I think that uh, it's premature until we get to all the data points that we need. Thank you. Mm -hmm. John Gannon. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Beth, for testifying um, this morning and for all your hard work on pensions. Um, you said that BPIC is headed in the right direction. And I, I would agree. I mean, I think mm -hmm. uh, under uh, Tom Kalanka's leadership, um, mm -hmm. we've seen investment performance um, improve. We've seen fees decline. Um, those are both great things. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, the question I asked Tom was, how can we structurally ensure that that continues? So I don't want to point fingers at problems in the past, but how can yeah. we make sure Certainly. that we keep on the, the wonderful track we are on today? So I think there are a couple of things. Number one, um, paying the appropriate salary for a CIO. Tom and I went through a big interview process uh, for that uh, position um, uh, way back. And the problem we had in bringing in quality is everyone we talked to said, can't do it you know, for that salary. Can't do it for that salary. Uh, and I wanna thank uh, Secretary of Administration, uh, Suzanne Young, because we had that conversation with her and she said, okay, we'll give you a little more room on the, on the, on the, on the um, compensation side. Um, we're still at the low end, and uh, uh, no disrespect, uh, um, I would pay Eric 10 times more if I could. He's, uh, he does an exceptional job. But you have to have quality folks, and we've tried to do it on the, on the, um, uh, you know, on, on the cheap too many times. And uh, we were able to get a change there to allow us to bring in a quality person. We also need to retain that individual. And part of the way we retain him, that individual is making that individual, not just with salary, feel worthwhile. And this gets back to the, to the performance of the fund and recognizing that these people are adding value and, uh, and, and, and moving forward there. I think the other is to have that independent chair, that it would not be as, as, as um, uh, outlined in the proposal that the treasurer would be the, um, uh, the um, chair of the committee. I very much think that uh, VPIC has to live on its own um, and be, I wanna be on the committee. I think the treasurer should be on the committee, um, but I don't think the treasurer should be the chair. Um, and I don't believe that it should be housed within the treasurer's office. We will provide services, but I think it's an entity that stands on its own. It, it issues its own financial statements, to be very frank. That's what I see in Massachusetts, the um, um, uh, prim pension reserve investment management. I, it's been a while since I've been there. So I uh, had, to, had to think about the acronym a bit, but uh, they issue their own financial statements. They do work with us. When I was a deputy in Massachusetts, I talked to the person over in, um, in Prim every, every month, talk about cash flows and how much money they needed and warn them that if they needed more after they set the, we set the numbers, they weren't getting it, you know, and, and things along that line. That, uh, but So we would have to have those relationships. But the reality is that um, that is a, in my mind, a better model than the one that we're looking at right now. And uh, I think that um, compensating people correctly, compensating the chair. I have to tell you what Tom does, uh, you know, in terms of the amount of time, the amount of salary he gets, which is one third of the treasurer's salary, which, you know, um, isn't that much, um, but uh, that uh, the amount of t money he gets for what he has to do, he'd make, a, you know, um, a, a lot more money. I, was, I shouldn't say it. I was going to say at, at um, as some other job, I won't say, and, um, and have a lot less stress. And uh, um, you need to bring in people that are dedicated. And uh, so I think the compensation of the chair should be looked at down the road too, uh, because it, you know it's hard to bring in volunteers that will do this day in day out, especially in this such a grueling, intense environment that we're seeing in terms of our um, our national, state, and local um, um, institutions right now. Well, th thank you for that. And just to follow up on the prim model, because I am quite familiar with that and yeah. the compensation um, that like Michael Trotsky. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, pulls down. Um, you know, I think there would be some people on this committee and some people in the legislature that would have heartburn um, yeah. over, over some of those salaries. Um, yeah. Having been in the securities world, um, obviously on the regulatory side, I understand those salaries um, and, and the need for them, but how can we convince other people of the importance of that type of compensation? Sure. Well, I think it's a it's it's two part. You know, when I left Massachusetts and came to Vermont, uh, deputy treasurer there came here as deputy treasurer. Um, I took a big cut in pay, okay, and I wanted to because I wanted to be in Vermont. I enjoyed the lifestyle, and uh, you know, and it's a type of political environment uh, as I was talking about in the in the front end. And I hope we keep it where people work together collaboratively. Uh, you know, as opposed to, as I say, the uh, the institutions we see in D.C. Um, so um, I was willing to do some of that, okay, uh, when I came here. Um, the, 
I just lost the train of thought. I'm sorry, uh, Representative Gannon. Can you just run that by me one more time? Yeah, it was it was gaining the compensation issue of yes. the amount of money that you have to pay sure. uh, investment experts um, yeah. that you to retain yeah. them and to get the, yeah. the best people because if you're going to play with Wall Street, unfortunately you have to pay close to what Wall Street. Yeah, has. you know it. Um, thank you. And again, I don't think it has to be a massive. Um, salary, you know, I think that Vermont has ways of, of uh, in terms of its quality of life to um, to to attract people. Uh, that's why uh, many of us are here. Uh, that said, you need to be able to compensate employees um, uh, appropriately. I'm not too fond of bonuses over benchmarks, to be honest, which is one of the models I do see in, in Prim and others. And I think that that gets into uh, you beat the benchmark, but you had a loss um, and you get a, a, a X amount of bonus. And I think that that equation doesn't really work uh, for me. Um, it uh, might work for some folks in other in other uh, uh, entities. But um, I do think that proper compensation, proper training um, and uh, and the ability to have a meaningful job is, is, is important to me. It's important to people that are here. I know it's important to everybody in this room and, uh, and making sure that folks have that, um, uh, that have that flexibility, but recognizing that it does cost to produce results. You have to put in the cost to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Beth, for, uh, for sharing your thoughts with us and also for giving a few moments for committee questions. Um, we have three more folks that I'd like to hear from before we break. And we do have a hard stop at noon because I know a number of people have um, lunchtime meetings. Um, so I think next what I'd like to do is, uh, is go to Mark Crow. Um, the Vermont Business Roundtable had a pension and health benefits task force, uh, has one. Um, and uh, Mark, I'd like to invite you to share uh, any thoughts or perspective you have on governance changes in Vermont's retirement system. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, thanks everyone for taking this on. I uh, really, really appreciate the thoughtfulness and thoroughness of this process that I've seen so far. Um, as, as uh, Madam Chair pointed out, I'm representing the Vermont Business Roundtable and the chair of their Pension and Retirement Health uh, Benefits Task Force. Um, but uh, with, at the risk of uh, giving away my age, uh, in a past life, I was a business attorney uh, for 19 years too long and uh, worked with a lot of different types of organizations and entities, and as a result, have significant experience uh, around governance issues. Um, so basically where I'm coming from and where the uh, round table is coming from is our concern is that, you know, there's basically three tenets to address, we believe, in providing best practices for strong governance. One is effectiveness and efficiency of operations. Two is a level of expertise. And three is a level of independence. Now, looking at what has been proposed, we think uh, this proposal goes a long way towards achieving these tenets, but of course, we do have some thoughts for consideration. Um, starting with the effectiveness slash efficiency of operations uh, uh, tenant, um, and specifically focusing on board size, uh, we agree with a lot of what's already been said here. We think that uh, a 15 member board with 13 members voting will get unwieldy um, and, and not be as effective as it could be. Um, you know, with, with respect to charitable nonprofits or, uh, or associations, for example, that number of board members and higher is not uncommon. But for boards that are at managing operations like this, it is, it is much more uh, uh, prevalent to be at a smaller size. And as uh, uh, I think Tom pointed out, and as uh, uh, Representative Gannon uh, submitted, the Boston College Resource Research Report recommends six to 10 board members and actually they, their report says 58% of who they uh, reported on have board sizes of eight to 13. Again, we think that allows for not only stakeholder participation, but is then small enough to function effectively. Uh, so that's our main comment as far as uh, uh, effectiveness and efficiency. Uh, the next uh, tenant I wanna address is expertise. Um, we feel this is vital to ensuring good governance. And we really applaud the efforts of this proposal to try to provide that. Um, I, we will point out though, that we do think that that 
expertise needs to be defined in a more definitive fashion in the proposal. And that's for a couple of reasons. One, to take any sort of, uh, uh, or to take as much of the discretionary decision-making as possible out of it, and thus any sort of politics that might enter into it. Um, and to make it easier to understand who fits that bill so that everybody's expectations are properly managed. And two, as I think Tom uh, alluded to earlier, uh, my gut says that uh, there isn't really a huge pool of people that might meet that the level of expertise you're looking for, depending on how it's defined. So it's better to kind of, I think, factor that in up front and, and factor that into the criteria that you want to uh, consider when defining what expertise means. And then um, the last bucket, which is independence or some level of that, uh, I have a few, a few points under that. Um, one is, um, as far as the composition of the board and uh, the investment committee. Um, again, setting aside the size uh, uh, for now and just focusing on what's been proposed. Um, I, I, you know, really, we, we obviously there has to be some uh, uh, interested parties or this won't work. Um, and, and, but there also needs to be a sufficient level of independent, non-interested parties um, to, to make this effective and fair to everyone. Um, and we, th and, we th and it, this proposal d attempts to do that through uh, the uh, employer representatives and the public representatives, um, and to a lesser extent, the legislative appointees. As far as the employer and public representatives, uh, we recommend, one concern is that they are in both instances nominated by the board, by the trustees. Uh, yes, there are, they're supposed to appoint three people for the governor or treasurer to choose from, but we think having them nominated is, uh, by, the, by the trustees is just too much of a, a, a potential for uh, electing a semi-interested party to a position that is uh, to be non-interested. Non um, and as an example, uh, there was a commentary today uh, from a gentleman by the name of Matthew Cunningham Cook in the uh, Vermont Digger, who uh, is, uh, I think, a very interested party in one direction regarding this issue. But he would uh, is also a public pension expert, and if we had three of them of people like him nominated nominated by the board, I don't know that the subsequent appointment by the governor or treasurer, whoever it might be, uh, uh, would be uh, would be agreeable. Um, two, uh, are, as far as who appoints it, appoints these positions, again, I'm talking about the employer and public reps, um, we think it should be done by the governor or the legislature or a combination of both. Uh, now, in one instance, I think it's the public, it is done by the governor, but as far as the, uh, uh, the employer board, it's done by the treasurer, who again is a beneficiary uh, under these plans, and so we don't think that I, I not as, as the position, not talking about Beth in particular, but we don't think the treasurer uh, should be appointing that uh, uh, or, or a person. Um, you know, and also I will say that if you look at the present um, uh, structure, you know, really at the bottom line, there's really only two totally independent trustees. And those are the ones uh, appointed by the governor. I guess you could also say that the commissioner uh, uh, might be also uh, indirectly a government appoint, appointee. And there's a max of, uh, and then if you, as I said, if you consider the three public board members as independent, yes, maybe technically, but again, if they're nominated by the uh, trustees, I'm not so sure. Um, now I move again under the independence bucket, if you will, or tenant, uh, the legislative appointees. I guess on that point, um, I'm confused because I, I'm not sure what the point of having them uh, included is if they have no voting power. Um, yes, I understand that they uh, uh, will provide experience because they have to be experienced to be appointed and so can advise from that perspective, but you're already getting that from the uh, public appointees to some degree. And, and the other thing is, and I'm gonna touch on this a little bit more below, below, the other thing is if they're supposed to be uh, 
uh, quote, watchdogs to some degree for the legislature, I think there's a more direct and better way uh, to do that. And I'm gonna talk about that in a second. Um, then, then I'm moving to the investment committee, again, under this independence tenant. Um, right now, it's supposed to be comprised of five, uh, three of which need to be, have experience. In our opinion, all of these uh, uh, committee members should be independent. Um, and uh, right now, there could really only be, uh, at the most, uh, the, the, if we took it at its face, that would mean that only the public uh, uh, appointees could really serve. Yes, the treasurer sh definitely should be on it and should provide guidance, but our opinion is that she shouldn't have the ability to vote. Uh, again, because she's ultimately a, benef a beneficiary under these plans, and uh, she or he, sorry, Beth. Um, and so we think truly that investment co committee needs to be uh, totally independent. Uh, and again, the other thing that needs to be clear is in saying who has experience on there, it's not clear under the current proposal whether these legislative appointees who have no vo voting powder, power would qualify as experienced members of the investment committee. So I think there needs to be, be some clarification there. Um, uh, I do, uh, I know that uh, Beth has talked about a few different models um, as far as, far as uh, uh, how the, the board can be comprised. I'm not familiar with those other models, but in looking at the New Hampshire, New Hampshire model, which this has been uh, uh, modeled after, uh, I'm wondering if, it, we're wondering if it should be even closer model to the New Hampshire model. Again, to simplify, and, and reduce the number. In that model, uh, which you may or may not know, there's one person from each board, there's one person from each employer, there's the treasurer, and they're all appointed by the governor or in New Hampshire's uh, situation, also the executive council, which is works with the governor. That's something we don't have in our government. Um, and it, so, cause I do, again, I think simple is better. Um, the other thing about independence uh, is there should be a mechanism for uh, determining what constitutes uh, potential conflicts of interest. Um, again, maybe that's addressed somewhere else, but I think it's important that it should be w addressed within this uh, document, however it, it uh, is formatted ultimately. And, and at a minimum, it should, it should uh, provide that no, no one, no, none of the independent, quote, independent uh, 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 members should have a direct or indirect ec economic relationship. Um, for example, they shouldn't work for an investment advisor who is somehow investing funds on behalf of uh, 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 the, the pensions. Um, and then also there, should be, uh, there shouldn't be any family uh, directly or indirectly beneficiary serving. So anyone who's on, who serves shouldn't have a spouse, a parent, in-laws, siblings, or children who are somehow benef benefiting from uh, the, the beneficiaries. Again, there's a wealth of, uh, of documentation and, and ethical considerations around this and forms that you can pull from to come up to define this. But at the bottom line, there needs to be a definition of what constitutes a uh, um, potential conflict of interest. Um, a third uh, component under the independence is actuary selection. Again, maybe this is addressed elsewhere, um, but with respect to this proposal, there is there is a, it is addressed how the investment uh, people will be selected, but I don't see anything as far as how the actuary will be selected. And I think that's particularly important given um, all the talk around missed assumptions over the past several years. There should be some formal process, some bidding process that's done on a periodic basis that selects the actuary. I don't think it's a good idea to have also to have the same actuary year after year after year, which has been done in the past. I know recently it, it was switched up, but again, there should be a formal procedure that everyone participates in to determine who that actuary is. Um, the, and I, the next point under independence is uh, legislative oversight. I, and this relates to earlier when I was talking about uh, the legislative appointees. Again, I'm not sure of the rationale for them, but I think a better way if it is to be quote a watchdog, the bottom line is somebody in the legislature needs to be looking over this stuff. Um, maybe technically they were in the past, but I think it needs to be uh, more, there needs to be more of a formality. And whether that's a joint committee of the Senate and the House, whether it's separate committees, 
there should someone should be looking at this. There should be annual reports issued by the by the, this committee to to the legislature um, uh, or some even sh shorter that talks about not only just the ADEC but all the other uh, pertinent information about what's gone, what's been going on, and and how things are going. Um, Again, I don't think the legislative, if that's their purpose, the legislative appointees go far enough in doing this. Um, another point under uh, independence is education. And uh, somebody touched on this earlier too. I think, and again, maybe this exists in the VPIC world, but I think for this, this uh, uh, entity, there should be an onboard, onboarding and continuing education for all members. Uh, and whether that's through workshops, whether it's through through a governance manual or both, or some other means of doing so, I think that's very important. Again, to get people familiar, even because even one, people who have expertise will need some refreshers around the specifics, but about pension and OPEB basics, about how the funding works, uh, about key terms that are involved, and uh, about investment standards, and probably most importantly about fiduciary duties and what that means on an individual basis. Um, again, the New Hampshire model has a lot of information about that I saw. And then the last piece under independence is, uh, I noticed in the proposal, there is a, a provision for the, trust, the trustee boards to make recommendations if there are proposed changes uh, made by the actuary and investment consultants. Again, I'm not sure I understand the purpose of this, uh, because uh, it seems like it's a second swipe at the ball since there already will be board reps at the, at the, at the uh, decision-making level. So why the trustee boards need to weigh in again independently uh, just seems to muddy the waters. Um, and also, you know, what happens if the, the board disagrees with the representatives? Again, further muddying of the waters. Um, so th those are the three tenants and the, the individual components under that we're concerned with. Um, as far, I do have a couple other points under the other category. One is we applaud uh, 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 including experience studies on a more frequent basis, three years, but we still think there uh, should be a stress test uh, uh, done. Um, and it would, we highly recommend at least an annual or, or two year basis. I mean, I just wanna be clear here that an experience study is not the same as a stress test. An experience study primarily looks at what has been done and, and where and, and how we did as far as people retiring, how, what benefit claims there were, that sort of thing. A stress test looks more at the, looks at the past too, but also looks at the future and, and looks at potential changes in the economic conditions. What would happen if there's a downturn? How likely is a downturn? What are we gonna do about it? So I just wanna make sure that, you know, that's great that we, we are gonna accelerate and have more experience studies, but I really think um, you should be considering incorporating the stress test, which I know was talked about in another uh, hearing. Um, and then, uh, uh, and then uh, I'm gonna, never mind on the last point. And then I'm, I'm gonna say one final thing, and I know I'm kind of crossing the line here, but I keep hearing about how there's so many factors involved, and all of which is true, that there's so many factors involved and that things are unpredictable and that the actuaries do the best they can based on the information they have. Meanwhile, finance people, we all know, try to predict things all the time, right? And so as I hear how we do the best we can and we're always trying to, but yet we're missing things and, but there's, because there's so many different factors, I scratch my head and wonder, why are we continuing to go down this defined benefit path when, when we, we're always on the losing end of it? Again, I'm gonna shut up on that point, but it just, in listening to the things, it, I find it a little bit frustrating. But again, that's not about governance. I'm gonna stop there. Thank you again for very much for the time here. And um, uh, again, I appreciate your efforts and I'm open to any questions. All right. Uh, with respect to the governance proposal and uh, and Mr. Crow's reactions to that, does anyone in the committee have a question? All right, thank you very much for uh, for your clear outline and uh, and putting your observations into categories. I think is helpful for us to to uh, frame how we're thinking about the task at hand. Um, Most welcome. 
So committee, we, uh, we have John Harris with us, who is the chair of the teacher system board. So John, um, thank you for your patience this morning and uh, please share your observations with us. Well, thank you um, for asking me to testify today. Um, I, I, don't, I, I won't be repeating uh, what I, I heard from uh, Tom and Beth, but um, right out of the box, I think it would be a, 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 a huge mistake um, changing from the current um, BPIC model. Um, I have been uh, part of the retirement board and has, have watched the evolution of the current BPIC board from its original 17 member board down to the seven. Um, the changeovers that Tom has done um, so there has been, a, you know, an evolution of that, and I think it would be imperative now is to take the games that and the changes that have happened um, with the current BPIC board and to the concerns that were mentioned earlier um, in terms of trying to institutionalize these things so that when, when um, there is a change in um, leadership in terms of um, the chair or the, or the um, um, staff. I, I think that there are ways to um, have uh, legislation to support and, and, or, and or policies to support the, the direction in which the current VPIC is going. Um, VPIC size, I was there for the se at 17, I was there at, se at, at seven. Um, and, and, and I think the education component is critical, uh, as been mentioned by, by other people. Um, one of the reasons I left VPIC um, and had um, another member um, represent the uh, teacher's board was the time commitment and, and education, um, you know, to try to keep a full-time job. And then also, um, I, I was, you know, as an active educator, to, to miss one day a month a uh, full day, uh, I, I just couldn't do it. And, um, you know, to be out of the classroom at that time. So, you know, fortunately the retired member on our board had that expertise um, in finance because we were already prior to VPIC, the, the, in, the individual boards were doing all of the um, investment um, decisions themselves. So, you know, for, for us that have been on the board for, uh, when I first came on the board, um, our um, investment consultant um, actually had a, um, a, a workshop that in, in California that um, they asked all new members to attend. It was a five-day uh, um, conference on fiduciary responsibility and education. So, um, you know, the members that have been on the board and, and we have those that uh, have experienced that education. Um, so I, I think it's, it's really important to, to build on what we have, keep the board, current VPIC board small. Um, I'm in total agreement with the um, experience study moving to th three um, years. I'm in total agreement of trying to make this a, an independent um, entity, VPIC an in independent entity, and, and that transition and how to do it thoughtfully I think the governance study that Tom talked about is fantastic, and uh, our board would definitely um, support that. So, uh, and, and the unintended consequences of moving now. Um, so, I think it's all been said, and uh, I, I agree with with uh, both the treasurer and um, the chair of VPIC in terms of uh, their highlights and how we should move forward with that. Thanks, John. Um, questions from committee members. I know it has been a long morning um, when, when the committee members aren't diving to raise their hand as soon as there's a moment. So um, I do appreciate your focus and hard work, uh, committee members, and thank you for the folks who are with us to share their insights. I know this has been a long conversation. Um, so Roger Dumas, bringing up the, bringing up the, 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 Caboose here on this train um, uh, from the the state employees retirement system board. So thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Wonderful. It, I I agree with you. I hope I'm not 
being last and least uh, as to testifying before this committee. However, I want to thank you for inviting me back to testify. Uh, I would like to remind you uh, or make you aware that uh, I'm having a problem with my laptop. I brought it to the computer hospital two days ago and it was diagnosed that it's dying a slow death. And what it does is it disconnects me from the Wi-Fi. So if I lose you, I apologize and I will do my best to reconnect with you as fast as possible. With that said, uh, I would like to try to keep you within your time schedule and limit my testimony and focus it on the proposed pension government changes that you're, you and the vice chairman have submitted as of yesterday. And I would like to respond by saying that uh, given my 30 years of experience uh, on the board, uh, I would have to say that I would personally uh, opposed to what's being recommended in the report relative to the creation of a re Vermont Retirement Commission. And I say this for several reasons. One is I believe that it would make the overall process of best practices in addressing the, uh, all the factors and concerns that apply to the pension system more difficult and cumbersome. And I feel that creating this commission would add more people to the process and complicate the process even more. Secondly, I feel that uh, based on my preliminary review of your report, it would appear also that it would counteract the objective, one of your, the objectives that you have outlined in your report in streamlining the decision-making process uh, around changes to the actuarial assumptions. I think it would make that more complicated as well and more difficult to deal with. The, the third reason I would say is that I would like to address the board itself. It, um, uh, I feel that I, I testified earlier in your committee and talked about how the state retirement board being made up of eight members has a excellent mix of membership that, that makes up this board and that this the makeup of these membership bring a lot of professionalism to the board, a representation from all the various categories that apply to the pension system and representation from the governor's office representation from the taxpayers, representation from the active employees, and myself as a retiree. And given all the experience that these members have is that they bring the experience of financial management, employee management, healthcare management, actuarial experience in dealing with that. Uh, and a lot of experience is also available to us from the staff that the treasurer has brought in uh, in her office. We have the chief financial officer and his staff. We have the uh, director of investment and his staff. We have the director of retirement and her staff. These people are all there to assist the board and provide assistance to the board in the decision-making process. I think we were very fortunate to have this structure set up that helps the board and advises the board to make in making the decisions that we make. We recognize the difficulty and the challenge that we face and the decisions that we all make. But overall, I have to say that in all the years that I've been on this board, I think the current makeup of this board and the members, the current members that we have on this board at this point in time work very well together as a team. We question, especially like the actuarial report, we question the data and the information that is provided to us. We try to develop a comfort in what we understand and the decisions that we come to in responding to the actuarial 
and experience studies that are done and brought before the board. And with that, I would, if I was to make a suggestion, and I think Tom alluded to that, and I think John just alluded to that, and probably others as well, uh, I would I would also recommend that the uh, an ex experts in the field of board governance be brought in to review the makeup of the board that I just described, look at the professionalism of the people that are on the board, look at the experience and the training that is available from all the members that are on the board, and also probably the experience uh, that we have available to us from the treasurer's office and see what they come up with with a recommendation to this committee. Uh, I, I think it would be very helpful and serve the committee well. I would, I would like, and with that, in keeping my testimony fairly short, which I will explain, I would like to summarize my brief comments by saying that the, Yesterday, your report was first released and received by everyone, uh, and released by both the chair and the vice chair of this committee and presented their recommendations on the pension system. The retirement board has not had the opportunity to, re to review and discuss the committee proposal. This will be ultimately taken up as a priority at our next board meeting. Uh, as chair, whoops, as, as chair, excuse me, I don't know if I can turn that off. However, as chair of the uh, as chair of the of the state retirement board, I believe at this time it is premature uh, to further comment on the committee's proposal before the board convenes and discusses the committee's recommendations. In closing, I would also like to say that I do appreciate that this committee is taking the, this issue very seriously and look forward to working with you uh, after the entire retirement board has had the opportunity to review and discuss your recommendations. And I also would like to add that I echo much of the comments that John Harris has just made relative to uh, board the existing board that are that are currently available in decision-making process on the retirement system. And that pretty much concludes my limited testimony at this time until our board gets the opportunity to also weigh in on this matter. I thank you. Thank you, Roger. Mark Higley has a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Roger, you may have said it, but uh, when is your next board meeting? We normally meet uh, on the second Thursday of each month. Uh, the executive secretary of the board, uh, Eric Wolf Wolfing, is uh, the one that finalizes that this uh, board meeting. And at this point in time, we haven't been informed if that date is has been confirmed yet, because it is given the, the situation that we're currently addressing is that uh, the, the it is a strong priority that all members of the board be available to address this situation. Thank you, Roger. <laughs> Thanks again for, for being here today. You're welcome. Committee, other questions for Roger? All right, um, before we do a few announcements, uh, Mark Crow has his hand up. Yeah, I'm sorry, just one, one quick thing. And that is, if you are gonna stick with VPIC, and that really wasn't the focus of my testimony, but if you do decide to do that, I do hope you consider adding um, some, another member um, with experience and or uh, a, another independent advisor, whether that's so, someone who represents the taxpayers, if you will. I only say that because right now the current composition, there's basically only two purely independent uh, members. There is a third, there's a third that's appointed by everyone, but they have no voting power. So I just hope you take that under consideration. Thank you. 
So I want to extend a big thank you to all the folks who uh, who have stuck with us through a long conversation this morning um, and uh, a lot of good nuggets of information and wisdom on um, on pension governance. Um, look forward to continuing this conversation in the coming days and weeks. Um, and so that is the end of our committee hearing this morning. Um, committee members, we have uh, a decision point ahead of us in terms of uh, how to make adequate time in our public hearings that are upcoming. Um, and so we are currently at 130 something people who have signed up for our hearings. And um, we really only have capacity for about 35 people each night. And so the question is, uh, would you prefer that we um, ask folks to stick to two minutes? And, uh, and that essentially gets us um, up to about 50 people per night. Would you be willing to add an extra half an hour to the Monday meeting in order to accommodate <clears throat> more voices or, or both? Uh, those are the two options that are ahead of us. The, the speaker has uh, has recommended that we not um, try to add a third public hearing night. So committee, uh, the question is, do we wanna uh, shorten the length of time that people speak uh, or lengthen our evening or both? And Bob Hooper. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Unfortunately, as after I put my hand up, you just uh, said that my suggestion was not uh, in favor. I, I think we're hearing from Vermonters on a very important issue. And quite frankly, I don't mind investing another night. At minimum, I would not object to extending. Um, two minutes is kind of a short thing. I think a lot of people are going to say, don't do this to me and that'll get very repetitive, but that's why we're here. And we hear that about guns all the time. Um, either mechanism for moving forward uh, would be better than cutting it off at what it is now, I suppose. I'm very sensitive to hearing people's opinions. I think that's what we're here for. And uh, as a big gun owner, I said that as a big gun owner. Peter Anthony. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I, I want to stick with the three minutes. I'm glad that extra time is being added on the Monday. Uh, I'm not sorry it's not being added on the Friday, uh, I have to tell you. But I wonder if channeling uh, or directing as, again, between governance and the uh, benefit package would help um, direct people to avoid the don't do this to me, which is not information per se. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure how you would structure that. I would, I would uh, delegate that to yourself and the vice chair to sort of figure out whether we have a half hour on governance and a half hour on <clears throat> don't do this to me, uh, I, I'm not sure, but <clears throat> it seems to me focusing the feedback would be very helpful. Thanks. Mark? Yeah, I, I, I disagree with the three minutes. I, I think uh, two minutes is plenty. I know other public hearings that uh, I, I've been at, it's, it's pretty much because of the numbers uh, limited to two minutes. Uh, so I would be in favor of the two minutes. And if another half hour would uh, fit all those folks in, then, then I would uh, uh, be appreciative of that. I, I hope, though, that in the future that uh, the committee is at least uh, made aware or to discuss a few minutes uh, when these public hearings might be. I mean, it's great that uh, the speaker or, or whomever uh, figures out these times and dates, but... Uh, uh, we also have commitments as well as committee members, and I think it's important for you to consider uh, our other commitments as well. Thank you. Tanya Behovsky. Thank you. Um, I would certainly support extending time on Monday, and I will also say that I'm hearing from many constituents that are unable to sign up because they're being told that it's full. So I would sort of push back against the idea that we shouldn't have an additional day. I think these are changes that stand to impact thousands of people across our state, if not everyone, given the, the work that these essential workers do, and we owe it to do the due diligence to hear from all of them. Uh, so yes, we do have um, 
we do have a mechanism where people can submit written testimony as well if they were not able to sign up. Um, and, uh, you know, I do need to defer to the speaker who negotiates the availability of um, staff time uh, in order to support us when we do uh, these big public hearings. So uh, we will continue this conversation, um, but for the time being, um, I think let's book an extra half hour on Monday and plan that meeting to go four to 6.30 and, um, and we'll see uh, how it breaks down in terms of how we can encourage the folks who didn't get a chance to sign up um, to be able to share their thoughts with us. So thank you for your hard work this morning, committee. Um, we are done now for this morning and I appreciate your, uh, your hard work and attention to these difficult topics. Peter? Yes, thank you. One thought I had after the division of opinion about two versus three, you could, if you stick with three, you could say we'd appreciate people to testify on governance for a minute and uh, benefits for two or something like that so that you, you get some diversity, uh, if you will, across the attendees. Thanks. All right. Um, I understand that floor is likely to be long this afternoon. Um, so it is unlikely that we will get back to committee today. And so it has been wonderful working with you all and I'll see you in committee tomorrow morning.